Welcome back to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. We're continuing discussion with uh, Julian Gilchrist, Executive Director of NARAL Pro-Choice Connecticut. First of all, backtrack and tell our audience who you are, what brought you to this point, a little something about yourself. Okay. So I'm Jillian Gilchrist, Executive Director of NARAL Pro-Choice Connecticut. I came to Connecticut in 2000 to attend the University of Connecticut. I graduated in 2004 with Women's Studies. Um, my primary focus at that point in time was preventing sexual violence, so I took a job as a child advocate at a sexual assault crisis center um, where I saw over 400 children in a year's time. Uh, the crisis center covered New London County, Wyndham County, and some of Tolland County. And I grew very frustrated by what I saw as a lack of policy to help with preventing sexual violence, in particular against children. Um, and that led me to a job at the state capitol, working for now Majority Leader Denise Merrill, mm -hmm. who at the time was the co-chair of the Appropriations Committee. And I learned an unbelievable amount of knowledge in my two and a half years there. Um, at the same time, got my master's in social work from the University of Connecticut with a focus in policy practice. And actually had the opportunity while working at the Capitol and going to school to get my master's to work on the emergency contraception for rape victims bill, which uh, guaranteed when a rape victim presented to a hospital in Connecticut, she'd be offered and then provided emergency contraception. And that debate, I was just very naive when I came into the Capitol it thinking. It seemed like a natural, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's very natural. Again, it took the violence against women aspect of my passion and uh, offering women emergency contraception, it just made sense. And it took two years to pass that bill. And it actually became a debate over abortion, even though emergency contraception isn't abortion at all. It's something to prevent a pregnancy, which would lead to an abortion. Exactly. Um, so it seems like that it, it would be something that everybody should unite around. Pregnancy prevention. Yes. What a concept. Exactly. But no, it was twisted and became a debate about abortion and about religious rights over women's rights, quite frankly. Do some people believe, I mean, I, I hear from, that some people actually believe that using any kind of contraception is actually tantamount to abortion. Yes, you speak with some pro-life people and that's their belief. And, and they do believe to them that emergency contraception is an abortion, even though it's not. It's a high dose of birth control and prevents a woman from becoming pregnant. Um, but to them it is. And so, you know, on the, the last show, I, I spoke about the fact that those really aren't the people, I'm not trying to convert anybody. If you firmly believe that, then you firmly believe that. Mm -hmm. And we're never going to be able to agree on that. But there might be ways we could agree on preventing unintended pregnancies. You know, always debating about abortion, is it right or is it wrong? Mm -hmm. If you firmly believe it's wrong, well then, that's your belief, and I'm not going to be able to change that. But why don't we have discussions about how we can prevent unintended pregnancies, therefore reducing the need for abortion? It seems odd that 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 you know, the one the one side, the one extreme, if you will, firmly believe they're firmly against pregnancy, against uh, abortion. We're on where we are. We're. We're not against abortion. We're not. We're not. We're not for abortion either. We're we're pro-choice. Exactly. Which involves the whole gamut of decisions that a woman makes. Exactly. Including bearing a healthy child. Sure. Yeah. And so, I mean, back to the sex education. That's a part of sex education too, and we can change that name, but. Um, teaching young women and young men how to be good parents. How about that? There's what a, a concept. There's a concept, yeah. Family values. Family Can values. you imagine? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Now, what happened in the Capitol? You mentioned the, the, the debate over this issue. How did it evolve? What became of it? And you mentioned that it surprised you that it even became an issue. Yeah. What happened chronologically? Kind of what happened as you saw it evolving? That first year was an election year, mm -hmm. and so many legislators didn't want to have a vote on the bill, and so it was actually filibustered in the Public Health Committee that first year mm -hmm. and died. Um, but a crazy thing that happened that year was that the then victim advocate of the state, um, I'm forgetting his name, but he came out against it, which blew everybody's mind because he actually 
defended the standpoint of religiously affiliated hospitals um, over women victims of sexual assault. Um, so that's when it really, I mean, the bill had been um, politicized and made religious, but he then kind of pushed that a little further, being the state victim advocate, taking a religious standpoint. Were a lot of were a lot of um, were a lot of uh, senators and representatives of, afraid to, to alienate people and just uh, tried to avoid the vote and, and the issue entirely, just to avoid alienating their constituents. Some of them. Yes, it became. I mean, it was a. It became a religious issue, and so legislators wanted to avoid angering Catholics, quite frankly. And the bill was introduced because because. Um, not all hospitals, it was different for every hospital, including non-religious hospitals. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until the Catholic um, diocese did put down a directive that would prevent Catholic hospitals from offering and providing emergency contraception. So that's when advocates had to step in mm -hmm. um, because just because you present to a religious hospital over you know what you had said before they they do receive public funding um, and a woman doesn't know presenting to a religious hospital that she's not going to be able to get get all the information or services she would have gotten at a different hospital um, in the instance of sexual assault. How did they skirt federal law with that? Because apparently if a, if a hospital receives federal funds they're required by law to provide this whole variety of services to people coming to that hospital and they can't deny services that are legal in United States law. How do they get away with it? Well, those are federal amendments, and so slowly over time they have been chipped away. There's the church amendment um, and another amendment that I can't think of the name, but that allows... No, no, the Hyde Amendment, I know, because Henry Hyde, and that became a big argue, a point of contention in the health care debate because uh, we had, uh, you know, they talked about... Um, reducing abortion rights and, and choice rights dramatically as part of getting the health care bill, and they made some compromises there, when in fact they already had in place this Hyde Amendment exactly. from about 20 years ago, which said that federal funds cannot be used for abortion. Exactly. But well, they the, wanted to codify that rather than, or further codify that in law. Yeah, in the health care debate, mm -hmm. and it did go farther. Yeah. Because now women have to write two checks, two separate checks, if they choose... Uh, coverage that offers abortion. But the amendments I'm talking about have been passed over time um, that allow medical staff their beliefs to trump, again, the services offered. So that's where a Catholic hospital does have that right up until the point that Connecticut passed the state law. Um, but then that second year of the debate, so the bill died that first year, mm -hmm. and then the second year um, when we all came back and worked on it again, we actually used language again. Language will keep coming up in uh, this movement. And so instead of calling it, the first year we called it emergency contraception for rape victims. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the slogan. The second year was compassionate care for rape victims. And we actually used, um, on the mission statements of Catholic hospitals, they say that they provide compassionate care. And so we kind of um, questioned what is really compassion. And so I think the language helped. And then in the end, um, a state representative, Deb Heinrich, actually yes. spoke out um, as a victim of sexual violence. And that really moved a lot of people who maybe hadn't been moved before. And she's a relatively new representative, I believe. Yeah. She's, she's, yep. she's terrific. I, she I helped terrific. her out on her campaign to go door to door. And uh, she's, she's one, of the, one of the best ones. She's not afraid to speak her mind. No, she's not. And that's, that's important. I mean, when, when a legislator... Um, votes or chooses to avoid an issue, but, uh, but when they actually choose to, to meet an issue head on and vote on something, you know, that's, that's important. That's important to the constituents, that, that, the, that, the lead, that leaders lead. Yes. And she's a leader among leaders in that respect. And in that de debate and during the debate, we just, the advocates kept hearing, we need to see a rape victim that this has happened to. And that's really difficult. There's a, a lot of victims of sexual violence don't want to come forward and be the poster child of sexual violence. And so... It's an embarrassment to begin with, having been there, but, but to have to relive the experience again? Yeah, and so... And, and answer questions of, of quite frankly, middle-aged white men to answer yes. their questions, when it probably was a middle-aged white man that was the perpetrator to begin with, 
and then to be um, to be dragged through the mud, so to speak, again, and have to talk about what was a horrible experience. It is hard to get somebody to actually come forward and and volunteer to go through that. And so that's why when Representative Heinrich finally took on that role, quite frankly, for the coalition, um, it was wonderful. It was amazing. She's a very strong woman. Now, can pharmacists at CVS can they refuse to write prescriptions for birth control? Do they have that right? Is this where we're headed? They do have that right. Um, well, in the state of Connecticut, I, I, this was before my time at NARAL, but the Attorney General did have a fight against Walmart. And mm -hmm. so the policy as it stands, I believe, is that if a pharmacist feels uncomfortable, they need to have someone else available to do it. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. And we just did some research on emergency contraception in pharmacies. And so emergency mm -hmm. contraception is actually over the counter for those over the age of 17. Right. Um, and there are pharmacies that choose not to stock it for religious reasons. And for our audience's uh, edification, um, we're talking about the morning after pill where a woman gets pregnant, um, whether it be by rape or by happenstance or for whatever reason, and she decides that she doesn't want to be pregnant and she wants to... Um, to prevent the pregnancy from actually taking place from the, um, I, uh, you'll have to explain it yeah, technically. So it's, so it's not that a woman knows she's pregnant, it's that a woman had unprotected sex. And might be pregnant. And might be pregnant. And you have, um, so within 72 hours it is recommended that yeah. it would be most effective. And so you can go to a pharmacy um, within 72 hours over the age of 17 and you don't need a prescription. Um, but we did find that there's some pharmacies that are not stocking it. Um, some were just out of stock, but some purposefully choose not to stock it. And then that is, that is the right of the pharmacy. Now, what's the, um, what's the, uh, the religious group that doesn't believe in medical care? Who is that? Um, a, a, Scientology? Uh, uh, Christian scientists. Okay. What if you had a, a pharmacist, let's say hypothetically, that was a Christian scientist could they be in that pharmacy and, and choose not to, not to hand out any medication for anything? I mean, this is exactly what we're, I think what we're talking about here is pharmacists individually using the power to override what their job is, to not do their job. I mean, if, if you could do that for, um, for birth control medication, why, why couldn't a pharmacist just refuse to dispense medication of this kind or that kind or any kind and just say, well, I don't believe in that, so I'm not going to do it? You know? Yes, and that could be. And that's why it's so absurd because if we, were to, if we the pro-choice community, were to make that debate, someone would say, well, no one would ever take that job if they didn't believe in medicine. But then it's, you know, to me, if you are signing on to be a pharmacist or a doctor, mm -hmm you are signing on to provide people with all medically accurate services, all medically accurate information. So in fact, they do make that decision. And, and, it, and, it's, and the question begs, begs to be asked, what are they doing in a pharmacy if they're not willing to do their job? Exactly. What if, what if I were a postal worker and I said that, well, I'll, I'll deliver every street except for that street? What if I were a doctor and I said, well, I'll help Everybody, but but if somebody's if somebody's choking in a restaurant, I mean, I don't want to have them spit up on me, so I'm not going to do the Heimlich maneuver on them. Exactly. How can how can pe professional people pick and choose areas of their job, their chosen profession, and do them do them, and, and then chooses other areas of their of their chosen profession and choose to not do them? That, that it's totally absurd. And it's women's health. I mean, it's all about what health. we saw in the healthcare debate is that. Women's reproductive health is their health. Yeah. These are, you know, most young women only have their OBGYN. Mm -hmm. um, they don't go to a general practitioner. You know, this is our preventative health. And so to block that is just absurd. And it's allowed right now. It's completely allowed. And that's the trend that the pro-life movement has been going in. And they've been doing a good job at slowly chipping away those rights. What's their ultimate objective, do you think? I mean, a lot of them say that, um, that women should be, I guess, essentially barefoot in the winter and pregnant in the summer and, and, and should be subjugated by, by, their, by their husbands. I mean, is, is this, do they believe that, some of them? When I 
am up at the Capitol, and the two opponents to our group are the Family Institute of Connecticut and the Catholic Conference, and they come out against, again, comprehensive sex education, which includes abstinence. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe they must want us all to go back to a day like that because preventing people from getting information to prevent unintended pregnancy, which would reduce the need for abortion, which in my mind would be what they really would want, mm -hmm. they, they must want to go back to a time when women didn't have knowledge about their bodies and weren't allowed to make decisions. So essentially to disempower women, to take power, any power away from them and subjugate them again, make them into chattel or, or, or slaver, slaves again. Yes, otherwise I think they'd work with us on certain things, again, like comprehensive sex ed or mm -hmm. um, policies that do promote bearing healthy children. And keeping them healthy when they're children rather, yeah. than, rather than denying them health care, denying them. Uh, is this building bridges to the 12th century here? <laughs> I think so. NARAL. What does it stand for now? What changes are going place in terms of how NARAL defines itself in terms of the acronym and in terms of the organization? So NARAL now stands for National Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League. There's a NARAL Pro-Choice America, which mm -hmm. works at the federal level on policy, um, community outreach and education, and then um, has a PAC to get pro-choice candidates elected. And we replicate that at the state level. So we have our legislative body, um, we have our foundation, and then we have our political action committee that gets state mm -hmm. elected officials who are pro-choice. Um, what we're doing at the state level is actually we're rebranding our foundation to be more inclusive of all the work we do. Um, so we're going to have definitely the words reproductive health in our foundation name. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet chosen the name, but will. Um, because you know, it's not that some people will say, are you running away from the word abortion? You know, I'll throw it out there. That's what a lot of people say, um, because the trend is to eventually actually move away from NARAL and be pro-choice Connecticut. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're running away. I think we're actually moving with the times. Um, my generation, we're called the millennials. I don't like that term, but I guess I'll accept it. Um, yeah. Some new research just came out, and I mean, we're post row. Mm -hmm. A lot of people always say, you know, you never grew up with never having it legal, so, never or saw, illegal. You never saw the battle being waged. Yeah. Um, but I always say we came up in a context, too, and our context was the divisiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were growing up, clinics were being bombed. There was always this heated debate. At that time in life, people were a lot more, the family was more religious. Um, our generation is also the largest generation to kind of remove ourselves from religion. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what millennial research is showing is that young people can have discussion about the morality of abortion mm -hmm. and maybe say I would never have an abortion mm -hmm. but I but, don't think mm -hmm. that I should be able to tell that to another woman um, and so why I feel it's important to change the foundation name is because we are so inclusive of all these other things like preventing unintended pregnancy and bearing healthy children um, reproductive health is the grand scheme and until we work on all those other issues just to be fighting for the right to access safe and legal abortion um, seems a little absurd so that's where the reproductive health and the, the movement has kind of been going. There's also this big war going on about um, a term family values and from my personal perspective now Diane and I we went to Ireland which is where my roots are second generation Irish American and uh, saw how in Ireland families are very close. They live very close to one another, um, extended generations, not just in the same town, but on the same block, spending a tremendous amount of time together, and the grandparents raising children while the parents are out working, and then when the parents are, they become grandparents, then they taking on the role of raising their grandchildren. And you have this, this skipping a generation, so to speak. And with Diane, who's from the Czech Republic and Slovakia, again, we saw the same thing. We saw, um, we saw families that lived at least in the same town, in most cases on the same street. They all came home for lunch. They spent a lot of time together. They had this incredibly tight family. And our co-host on the show, Emily Volpontesta, who lived in Italy for the better part of eight years, she saw the same thing where, where she talked about in a couple of the shows 
where they don't even have nursing homes, so far as she could tell. Don't even have nursing homes in Italy. It's just a concept that, that because people take yeah. care of their grandparents, they stay together in the family right up until the time that they die. I mean, they, they live and they die in the house. They have the family around them. There's, there's never this disjoint, this nuclear family situation like we have in America. I understand that these other countries, Italy and uh, Czech Republic and Ireland, they're European, the, the societies and the, the cultures have been there for literally thousands of years, and America is a relatively wrong, young country. What is wrong with America that we don't have these family values that these European countries do? What's wrong with us? Is there something wrong with us about it? I think there's something definitely wrong with us. Um, I mean, the one that pops out to me is maternity leave. Mm -hmm. We don't even have paid maternity leave. I mean, Family Medical Leave Act, I'm glad it passed. Wonderful, but we had, it's, a, we had a fight for that. It's unpaid leave. I mean, mm -hmm. and it is, it's fabulous, and so I don't want to belittle it, but at the same time, having just had a child, when you really, when it dawns on you for the first time mm -hmm. that, oh, I get leave, but it's unpaid? No. I mean, that's really difficult for families to plan for. Yeah. Um, it puts a lot of stress on the family. Yeah. Stress that probably shouldn't, I don't think should be there. I mean, you know, we're supposed to support our family values and, and our families and, and do what we can as a society to, to keep families strong and protect them and nurture them. And yet, it's like pulling teeth to, yeah. get, to get people to have, have, the, uh, have time off from work, to, have, to let people have uh, enough time together um, during a given day, time off during a week, time off during a year. Uh, with family to, to strengthen these family values and, and we seem bent, hell-bent in America on, on dividing the families. Yeah. Making sure the kids, when they get a job, if they're going to get a good job, well, you get a good job, sure, but you've got to go off to Oregon or you've got to go off to someplace thousands of miles away to work and you never see your family again except maybe a, a couple of times a year. Yeah. Why couldn't we all work, a, work and be satisfied working where we're close to home even if you're sacrificing maybe a little bit of your career and, and dampening your career outlook a little bit in your prospects in order to stay t close and stay tight with family. I completely agree. And what I think there is this idea that to make it means to make it on your own. Mm -hmm. And that after college you are supposed to be able to you know, make it. And yeah. if we could all kind of come back closer um, yeah. You know, again, now having just had a child, my sister moved to North Carolina, my brother's out in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, every time we see each other, which is the twice a year, um, Thanksgiving, and then they come usually to visit in the summer, it's, oh, we wish we lived closer, you know, it'd yeah. be great. And that support would be amazing. I am lucky my parents aren't too far. They're uh, right over the border in New York, but yeah. um, even that's kind of far. You know, it'd be nice to have them on a daily there's basis. There's a strain. There's a certain strain, and, and, and it, it's got to be strained to, to not see people, but maybe twice a year, the people that are, that are in your heart all the time, but you don't get a chance to see them often enough to, to stay close to them. Yep. It and just, give support to one another. Yeah. Especially when there are children involved. Family values. Yeah. Family values. Well, that's something to throw out to our audience. What are we going to do in order to, to make America stronger and, and, and improve our family values and encourage, encourage our kids, encourage our families to stay close to home, even if it means maybe not being as monetarily successful as, as they could have been, um, maybe settle for a little a less money and a few less things, a little smaller house, uh, one less television, one less car, one less uh, iPod. <laughs> in order, it's a small price to pay. It seems to me to 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 have families close together. And you can always visit places. <laughs> you can always take trips. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, it, it's just it, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't get off on on, on, <laughs> on looking at it in such a sad kind of a way. But you know, we always try to find solutions here on this show. So maybe we, we g give us some solutions. What can we do to to, to, to right this wrong or to make, make this wrong a little bit better? What can we do as a nation? Well, I mean, I always go toward policies. So I think family-friendly policies would be helpful to begin with. Again, some type of paid leave for maternity leave. Um, 
that's where I would start. I would also start with what I talked about before um, mm -hmm. with paid sick days. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to have paid sick time can get the care we need, including prenatal care. Um, but I think we need to set a culture that we care about health and preventative care. Um, I don't know how that would lend itself to the family values piece. Um, well, you mentioned the paid sick leave days, and we spent a, a good portion of the summer and the fall talking about things like that under the health care bill, where, um, particularly in Connecticut, where, where they fought this battle over paid sick leave, so that, say, someone in the, um, in the health care industry or, in, or in, in the restaurant industry, rather than go to work, rather than being forced to go to work to get a day's pay, to go to work sick and maybe yeah. infect a lot of people because you've got something, you're coming down with some sort of, uh, some sort of bug or something, and, and, and the ramifications of, of um, going to work and getting know, 5, 10, 15, 20 people in a restaurant sick instead of one person staying home and having the, the support of their country and, and, uh, and the legislature to stay home for that one day and heal up and get better and avoid these, these things that can come out of it, these, uh, these, these horrible uh, uh, passing germs on it, especially in, in, in days nowadays where we have so many very virulent things that they're finding a way the, the swine flu, which we've, of course we've forgotten about now because it's been out of the news for a couple of weeks. Yep. You know these things come and go into the news and out of the news, and you know a matter of um, a matter of a couple weeks, and then we forget about them and, until it happens again. But one time it's going to happen, and it's going to be it's going to be very serious. We've got to wrap the show up there now. We've got a few seconds left. What thoughts do you want to leave our audience with? I would just want to leave with the thought that you know. Being pro-choice is being pro-choices and that it's providing women with all the information they need to make an informed decision. Um, and that if we are too focused on the debate and what separates us, then we're never going to be able to get to a place where we can prevent unintended pregnancies and reduce the need for abortion. And I think that's, in the end, what we all want. Thank you very much. I'm David Stevenson, Jillian Gilchrist. Thank you very much. And good evening. Okay, now we pretend to talk off camera. Oh, great.